The National Panel on Climate Change says major changes to our climate are inevitable and irreversible, and we, humans, are responsible. Do you think politicians will step up? 0345 6060973. You can also talk to Tom Burke, back with us, who chairs the E3G think tank. He was an advisor to the UK government on environmental policy. How are you, Tom? I'm, well, I'm pretty gloomy, to tell the truth. I've been spending the day listening to and talking about um, this report that we're talking about now. And it's a very, it's a very frightening prospect, frankly, uh, for all our futures, and especially, obviously, for people like Dominique, who've got a lot longer to live than either you or I, Eddie, uh, in a world in which this climate is changing in a dangerous way. What does this report do? Because, as Dominique was suggesting, a lot of this information, the ideas, are not uh, fresh. But um, it, it is pooling together. It's very comprehensive. It's eight years of work. Uh, how would you frame what it's telling us? It's telling us that the climate is change is happening now. For a long time, people have kind of more or less believed this was something that would happen sometime in the future. And what you've got happening, this report's come out at a perfect time when we're all looking all over the world at floods, at fires, at droughts, at extreme weather events, and we're seeing exactly what the science told us would happen. And so now you've got people's experience is validating the science. And I think over time that will turn into more pressure on politicians. But I think Dominique was a bit too kind, really, to uh, our politicians. I think they really have, they've let us all down, but they particularly let people of her age down uh, because we know what we've got to do to address this problem. We've known it, not for as long as we've known about the science, but we've known it for quite a long time, and we simply haven't stepped up and done the things we know how to do and we know we can afford to do. Uh, lots of people want to talk about this, uh, so stand by, Tom. Lots of questions coming your way, uh, and we'll get to those right now. Here is Gareth in Manchester. Hi, Gareth. Hello, thanks for taking my call. Um, I'm wondering why the UK doesn't use its ocean carbon sinks in its um, figures to offset some of the emissions, and also why, um, considering the more people we have in the country, the more um, emissions we put out, why um, stabilising the numbers of the population isn't a number one priority? Tom? Uh, we are just starting to... So the, I think or what Gareth's referring to is, the, in effect, the resource we have in all of the exploited oil fields off our coast, which we could use to sink at least some of the carbon, and we're just beginning to explore the possibility of doing that. It is going to be expensive, there's no question about it, but it will allow us to deal with some of the harder to tackle industries like the cement industry or the steel industry, where it's harder to see technological options available for reducing their emissions. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, unless, uh, Gareth, you're really talking about, should we try and stop immigrants coming into this country? No, no, uh, not at all, not at all. Uh, no. it, well, I'm it, talking it, about, it, it doesn't matter who it is, whether they're from here or from abroad, I'm talking about stabilising the numbers of the population. Because the more, more people that are in the UK, the, the more of everything we're going to use. That, that, that's just obvious. And uh, Philip makes a similar but more global point, and he says, if mankind is directly causing climate change, why is there no, t no talk about the increasing world population? In 1900, the population was about 1.4 billion. It's now 7.8 billion. Surely we should be reducing the population. That must be having an impact, Tom. Well, well, <laughs> oh, the increase in population has shaped my life. There were 2.5 billion people on the planet when I was born, and there are nearly 8 billion people now. And um, uh, the... Uh, environmental destruction I've seen has undoubtedly been driven not just by the number of people, but also by their consumption of ever more resources. So I'm completely sympathetic with the point of the question. We learned a long while ago that if you want to actually stop population, the thing growing uh, out of control, what you've got to do is invest in education for women and girls. And we found whatever the culture, we found if you do that, then people begin to control uh, their family size. So really important to see this. Uh, I mean, there isn't a technical solution to getting the surplus people. We're not about to go out 
and shoot them all. So you really do have to think ahead and say, how do you change the culture in those places where population growth is very large? Now, the good thing about that is, to some extent, we've succeeded in doing that. Population growth is much slower than it used to be uh, now. And it's if we can keep up educating women and girls, then we will slowly bring that down. And in some countries, populate like China, for instance, population has already started to fall. Japan as well. Italy is another country. So we've actually made more progress than sometimes people recognize in the global problem. Uh, Gareth, just uh, finally, before we let you go, what do you think of what this report is telling us? Um, it, well, nothing new, but it, it, I'm more concerned about um, actions. We, we seem to be looking at it globally, but the UK, we don't have the kind of authority. We can only do, we can only put our own house in order. And it seems to me the, the most obvious things that we can be doing right now, we're just skipping over them. Gareth, thank you. I want to get Elias on the air next. Hi, Elias, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, um, obviously... It's, it needs addressing um, right now, but I never hear anyone talking about nat the natural, how much of this is contribute towards nat nat natural things happen on the Earth. I mean, the Earth has got a lifespan. It's not going to be here forever. Um, the, the Earth does move away from the sun. Uh, I don't know if it's an inch or whatever they said a year or, you know. Um, so... The Earth obviously sits on on, on its axles, which which is not always, uh, you know, um, stable. So I wonder how much of this is actually contributed to man, and I wonder how much of it is actually natural. We'll get the answer from Tom in a second. But what do you think, Ellis? You you seem to have doubts about how much humans are causing this. Well. The, okay, the, you see, the Earth is cocooned. We, we've got the atmosphere, okay? So nothing comes in, nothing goes out apart from space. People go out there. So the elements of the Earth doesn't change. The, the amount of water what's on the Earth, it, it doesn't increase or decrease. All right, Tom, what do you say? The uh, report this morning was absolutely unequivocal. There are things that are happening, such as the fires in Siberia, that cannot be explained by natural variation, the kind of thing Elliot's talking about. So there is the absolute final statement. They've never actually said it quite as clearly before. Unequivocally, human beings are causing the climate to change. And of course, <laughs> what does come in is sunlight. That's the problem. And what we are doing is stopping that sunlight going back out to space, which is why the planet is heating up. Thank you, Elias. 0345 6060 as we pick through this uh, detailed report from the uh, panel on climate change and think about what needs to happen next. And if you are under 30 in particular, I want to hear from you because you will be living with the effects of this uh, long after I've gone and long after Tom's gone, although he's, he's going to look at least 110. Um, Norman says, I've always had more regard for David Attenborough and his warnings over world leaders. I'd be prepared to do what any individual should do to give future generations protection from the inevitable unless the world acts now. Uh, Rick and Lincoln, I'm fed up that the next generation has to sort out the mess created by the one above me. We tried our best, but we're shouted down at every instance. Does that remind you of anything? Maybe one way of reducing carbon is to get goods from the nearest countries rather than Asia. Uh, Harvey on Twitter says the government must listen to the IPCC report and activists, especially youth across the world, which are clearly asking for action to be taken now. We must reduce our emissions and stop funding fossil fuels. It's time to join the movement and demand action together. 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850 and tweet at LBC. We'll have more calls, texts and tweets after the headlines now from Tim Humphrey. The United Nations Secretary General has called a landmark study on climate change a red code for humanity. The report says human activity is changing the climate in unprecedented and sometimes irreversible ways. Wildfires continue to devastate parts of Europe and the US. At least four people are missing in Northern California. Officials there say they're battling the largest blaze in the state's history. Vodafone will be reintroducing roaming charges for British people travelling in other European countries. People can expect to pay up to £2 a day to use their phones. And the weather daytime showers will gradually fade during the evening and overnight, leaving clear spells a low of nine. 
LBC. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. Now, the government's position is that they want employers to help for a gradual return to offices over the summer. Many have spent well over a year. Have you spent more than a year working from home? Can I put it to you that if you have, and I'm sure you're going to say you've slaved, oh, I've never worked so hard, oh, the phone's going morning, noon and night. If they've lasted that long, just stay at home. Just sit in the greenhouse all day. I tell you what, we'll find someone who wants to come in and actually do the job. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. The future's yours with Lewisham College. Whether you're a school leaver or an adult wanting to further your career, Lewisham College has lots of courses on campus and online starting this September, including vocational and professional training as well as great apprenticeships with local employers. Take the next step at Lewisham College, your college in the heart of your community. Enroll in now. Apply at lewisham.ac.uk. Unlock your future at Lewisham College. Transport for London is proposing changes to the Central London Congestion Charge. The proposals are part of the commitment by the Mayor of London and TfL to reduce traffic and congestion in Central London, improve London's air quality, increase the number of people walking, cycling or using public transport. To have your say, visit tfl.gov.uk forward slash cc your view. Consultation ends on Wednesday the 6th of October. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Use code SUMMER to save £5 at zingflowers.com. Zing Flowers. Amazing every time. It's time to start thinking about swapping your lounge for your lounger and spoil yourself rotten. And that's something a Saga Boutique Cruise is rather good at. Boutique is your own VIP door-to-door -door chauffeur. Boutique is indulging in fine speciality dining in one of our restaurants. It's relaxing in the knowledge that travel insurance and cancellation cover for coronavirus is, of course, included. Go on, spoil yourself. Sail away this August aboard a newly released UK cruise. Search Saga Boutique Cruises. Travel insurance provided by Great Lakes SE. Cancellation cover provided by Saga. Subject to medical screening. Opt-out option available. Over 50s only. T's and C's apply. You come in. It's going to be good. Come on, mate. Come on, let's go. Don't miss out on your two COVID jabs. Don't miss out on the good times. Over two thirds of 18 to 30 year olds have already had their first COVID jab. It's easy and there's plenty of ways to get yours done quickly. Visit nhs.uk slash COVID vaccination to book yours now or to find your nearest walk-in centre. Go on then, don't miss out. Mayor on LBC with Sage, boss your business admin from anywhere. Climate scientists say major changes to our planet are inevitable and irreversible. Uh, let me know what you think of this report and whether you have faith that our political leaders will do what's necessary. And what are you willing to do? 0345 6060973. Tom Burke, who chairs the E3G think tank, is with me. And Jake is on the phone. Hi, Jake. What do you want to say? Hello. Good evening. Um, I wanted to say a couple of things that I've, I've kind of been listening to this throughout the day. And it seems to me that a lot of it has been put onto us people on the, on the ground level, should I say. But I'm wondering who's accountable in regards to these large corporations. And there's an example. I'll use a car company. Now, car, car companies produce a lot more cars than people actually buy. Now, my question is, is all of that is contributing to the climate, to issues within the climate. Why aren't these corporations being held to account? You're talking about putting faith in politicians, but these politicians don't seem to be doing what, what we elect them to do. So my, my frustration is, is it's all well and good saying, well, cut meat out of the diet, do this, we need to do that as individuals. But that's not stopping the production of cars. That's not stopping large corporations who are overproducing over what we're getting back through consumption. Where's the, where's the fines there? Where's the tariffs? Where are, why aren't government, why aren't politicians stepping up and speaking out? Why is it always being put back down to, oh, my personal carbon footprint? You know, mm. I saw uh, all of the G7 leaders flying from different parts of the world. Can you explain to me why I'm having to do Zoom meetings every week with international clients, but they seem to be able to fly here, there and everywhere? You know, if we started looking at individual, what our consumption was, you know, I would love to know what the politicians are, what the royal family is, what those who are famous, 
but it doesn't seem to be calculated. It's us who are bottom of the food chain that always seem to be one that scrutinised, and I have a real big issue with that, to be honest with you. Jake, thank you. Let me bring Tom in on that. I think Jake's got a point in the sense that there's far too much of government's politicians in particular failing to do what needs to be done, passing the buck to people and saying it's all about individuals doing their bit. And we've seen a lot of that lately. So I understand Jake's frustration. Individuals can't do their bit if politicians don't set a context in which it's possible for them to do their bit. So I think that Jake has, has a real point. Uh, about that blame, uh, you know, getting into a blame game with this doesn't take us anywhere. Everybody has to play a part. Everybody, all of us have to do it. But we can't do that unless our politicians make that possible. They enable things for us to do it. So people want to do their part by reducing their personal uh, consumption. Then politicians need to set in place the system. Uh, a context in which that is made possible for them. And they've not been doing that. They've been far too inclined to, uh, as it were, pass the buck and hope that individuals could do stuff. And they've been far nervous about the fact that people won't do what needs to be done to solve this problem. And I think they're underestimating people, as we saw again with COVID, where the politicians underestimated people's willingness to do the right thing when it's explained what needs to be done in a clear way. And they haven't done, the politicians haven't done that. Jake, thank you. 0345 6060 973. Uh, we'll have more uh, from Tom in just a moment. As always at this time, though, we bring you all the COVID headlines in one place. In the COVID report, here is LBC's Charlotte Lynch. Eddie, most coronavirus restrictions have now been lifted in Scotland. Nightclubs have reopened there for the first time in more than a year and rules on social distancing have been relaxed. But there is a big difference to England as face masks will still be required in shops and on public transport. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has admitted she is cautious about moving to level zero and has urged people to be sensible. I'm always nervous when we lift restrictions because we know that lifting restrictions gives the virus more opportunities to spread. So there's always a degree of nervousness about that. But equally, I know we can't keep legal restrictions on people's lives forever. So we've got to try to do these things at the right moment and as carefully as possible. We've deliberately taken a slow, steady path through uh, the lifting of restrictions. And hopefully that puts us in the strongest possible position. In the latest 24 hours, 25,161 new cases of COVID-19 have been recorded across the UK. A further 37 deaths within 28 days of a positive test were reported. And almost 90% of people in the UK have now had at least one dose of a coronavirus vaccine. It's hit exactly 89%. That's as the Pfizer vaccine's now been approved for use in 16 and 17-year-olds. And many were able to get a jab at walk-in centres across the weekend. That's as COVID vaccine hesitancy is almost halved among 18 to 21-year-olds in Great Britain, according to data from the Office for National Statistics. The figures also suggest that increasing numbers of 16 and 17-year-olds are willing to have the jab as hesitancy has decreased from 14% to 11%. The Health Secretary Sajid Javid has asked the competition watchdog to investigate the market for travel PCR tests in response to concerns about the cost for families travelling abroad. Analysis by the Liberal Democrats shows just 11% of providers are offering the PCR tests for under £50. Travel writer Simon Calder says it's putting a big extra cost on trips abroad. You can take the test at the airport when you arrive, but you've got to have a PCR test within two days of your arrival. And if you're coming back from an amber country and you haven't been vaccinated, that's going to be another test as well. Add that to the pre-departure test, which can be a lateral flow test coming into the UK. Basically, you're looking at about £100 per person. An unnamed government minister has been quoted as saying civil servants should have their pay reduced if they refuse to come back to the office. Cabinet ministers are reportedly planning a big push to get them to return to the office from next month. Business Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng has told LBC it wasn't him who made those comments, although a compromise is needed. We don't know when the COVID pandemic will, 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 will end. If, um, we don't know what the circumstances will be. But ideally, I'd like um, most workers, all workers in my department to be 
uh, coming in two or, or three days a week. I'm just reluctant to say it has to be you know, by September the 1st or September the 15th. I think it needs to be done fairly soon, but we need to look at where we are with the pandemic before we can make that call. France has extended its health pass requirements, which people must show before going to restaurants and cafes or taking long-distance train journeys and visiting hospitals. It shows proof of full vaccination, a negative COVID test, or whether someone has recently recovered from the virus. There have been protests against it for a fourth weekend. Official figures suggested this weekend more than 237,000 people demonstrated across the country. And Australia has expanded its New South Wales lockdown amid fears that coronavirus has spread from Sydney. The rural town of Tamworth, which is 257 miles northwest of Sydney, and the popular tourist spot Byron Bay have entered a week-long lockdown, although neither have recorded a single case. Charlotte Lynch with your COVID report, and we'll hear more from uh, France about those vaccine passports. Lots of protests again at the weekend in the course of the next hour. Uh, Tom is still with us. Tom Burke, who chairs the E3G think tank, as we consider this huge report from the IPCC. And Claire is in Haringey. Hi, Claire. Hello there. Hi, hi. Tom, um, what is the actual realistic, honest time frame for taking action? Because by my understanding, the, there is latency in the system so that the warming we're seeing right now is as a result of emissions for anything between 20 and 50 years ago. And that we haven't even experienced warming yet from the last, possibly if we're optimistic, the last 20 years alone. So if we stopped emissions literally today, if we cut out a- aviation, cut out, um, reduced meat and did all of these other things, and is there any hope at all that we can contain the warming of the planet? Because I don't see it. Please give me some hope. Well, you're absolutely right, Claire. There's a latency, so we don't see the uh, temperature uh, and the emissions go up line in line with each other. There's a lag between the temperature gets expressed from the emissions. Uh, but I think we have got quite a lot of reason to hope, actually. Uh, but what we must always remember is that the longer we leave it to deal with the problem, to stop emissions, then the worse the problem gets. We know exactly what we've got to do to arrive at the point when it stops getting worse, and that's we've got to stop burning fossil fuels. And we've got to do that by about the middle of the century. Can we do that? Technically, yes, we can do that. Economically, we can do it. Can we do it politically? I think that's a much more open question. But I don't think there's any reason to give up hope yet. Every Every year we delay in reducing emissions significantly means the problem goes on getting worse. So we know where we've got to get to. The question now is how to get the politicians to get us there in time. Thank you, Claire. Eddie on tech says the government's pushing us towards being all electric. If we switch completely to electricity, we're all running electric cars and heating and so on. Will the UK be able to produce enough renewable power to run the country? Yes, if we design the electricity system properly so that we make use of those resources and we uh, uh, eff- efficiently and we uh, introduce enough storage and enough technology to make sure the demand and the supply manage. And that includes, by the way, using vehicles, electric vehicles, as part of our uh, ability to manage the variability of renewables, then yes, we can do it. Whether we will remains to be seen, but we certainly can do it if we want to. 0345 6060 Cameron has called in. Hi, Cameron. What do you want to say? Hi. Well, so I, I work for the automotive industry and over the last two years have become an expert on all things related to diesel and emissions. But there's about a million and a half people in the UK every year who get on a cruise ship. And the cruise industry accounts for more than 10 times of all European uh, uh, emissions or, or car-related emissions. So are, are our headlines covered more by science or more by headlines or our, our legislation? Tom. Oh. I think there's no doubt at all that the politicians respond more importantly to headlines than they do to science. And you're absolutely right to pick up on one of the areas which has been slowest to respond, and that's the marine uh, shipping industry. It really has been very slow to pick up. There are technology solutions. We know that we can actually have shipping, both passenger shipping and freight shipping, that is clean. 
but we're really not investing enough fast enough to change over from our current marine diesels, which are very, very dirty indeed. Uh, Cameron, given all the research you've done and the expertise you've garnered in the, in the last few years, um, what's your reading of what the IPCC is saying today? Uh, well, the, the, the previous caller was actually making quite a, a, a stout um, a judgment on uh, you know, 100 companies producing you know, 70% emissions. I feel personally helpless. I feel that no matter how many people walk into my showroom and I transition them from a diesel to a petrol to electric car, it, it feels like it amounts to nothing if we're unable to tackle the things that don't sell headlines. Uh, thanks, Cameron. And that, Tom, gets to something we discussed when you were with us uh, the other week, talking about what we as individuals can do. It can feel overwhelming. And, and Cameron's right, isn't he? Yeah, he is. He is right uh, about that feeling, which is why the narrative that politicians produce is, is, is sometimes as important as the actual policy measures. Th there are some bits of this problem which require a small number of decision makers to make a very small number of dis very big decisions that make a huge difference. And then there's other bits of the problem, particularly heat, uh, what people do in their homes, and also agriculture, where you've got to get a very large number of decision makers to make a very large number of very marginal decisions, the aggregate of which adds up to something very significant. Now, you, you, if you look at it from where you are yourself, it looks like not very much and doesn't matter. But if you look at it from the point of view of what's happening in the country or the world, all those little individual bits actually add up to something significant. Now, our leaders need to be reflecting that back to us. They need to be telling us the story in which our individual actions make sense. And frankly, they're not doing it enough. Tom Burke is with us till five. Feel free to pick his brain and let me know what you think of this report, uh, particularly if you are under 30. 0345 606973. At 4.46, Tim has an LBC News update. A UN report is warning Europe will see more intense and frequent heavy rain and flooding as a result of climate change. The European Union has mobilised more support for Greece and Italy, which are experiencing devastating wildfires. Team GB's Olympians are now all back in the UK after the Tokyo Games produced 65 medals. And the weather daytime showers will gradually fade during the evening and overnight, leaving clear spells a low of nine. LBC Travel, I'm J. Louise Knight and the clockwise M25 is heavy in patches from 23 for South Mims to 28 for the A12. It's after two separate accidents earlier. It's then queuing from 30 at the A13 onto the QE2 bridge and anti-clockwise it's heavy from Swanley at 3 to the Dartford Tunnels. There are solid queues this afternoon both ways on the A40 to the Greenford Flyover. Some lights on Greenford Road have gone out. Now that's causing long delays back around the Hanger Lane Gyratory which in turn is causing queues on the North Circular. In the centre of Town Tower bridge is stuck because of a technical problem there are long delays on all approaches. The temporary lights on Chingford Road in Walthamstow at the Bell aren't working and causing queues. As for the two minor delays this afternoon on the Metropolitan Line as well as parts of the Piccadilly Line and on the trains, Chiltern Railways have delays of 20 minutes at Marylebone. This is LBC. For blowing away the cobwebs, for putting some fresh air into our lungs, for some time in the daylight and some in the spotlight. For the people we love, for the people we've lost for the one in two of us who will get cancer. We will race for life together again. We're finally back. Run, walk or jog to raise money for life-saving cancer research. Search Race for Life and sign up now in partnership with Tesco. Call and email 0345 6060 973. This is LBC. In a world ruled by speed, where destinies are decided by downloads, a hero has arrived. Hello. <laughs> I meant no sky broadband ultra fast. Huh? It's ten times faster than standard fiber, making everything you do online feel epic. <laughs> the next generation of broadband is here. No sky broadband ultra fast. Already available to 15.7% of UK homes and we're adding more every day. Comparison of average download speed of Ultra Fast Plus versus Standard Fibre. Speeds measured to Ruta, Sky.com. Take a handful of friends, throw in succulent pork slices and extra crispy crackling. Serve on a bed of noodles, mint and oh so crisp salad. Douse in a tangy soy chilli and lime glaze. Add a sprinkling of in-jokes and there you have it. My crispy pork noodles recipe. Come together and enjoy our Tesco finest pork loin joint. And scored for extra crispy crackling. Food love stories. Brought to you by Tesco. Available in selected larger stores. Excludes NI. Pablo the cat took pigeon patrol extremely seriously. Until one plucky bird led him high up a tree. 
and Pablo discovered he can't fly. Luckily, Pets in a Pickle had Pablo covered, and he was soon pestering pigeons once more. For pet insurance policies as unique as they are, visit petsinapickle.co.uk. Where can our trains take you this summer? Whether it's a much-needed catch-up with friends or a family day out, our advanced tickets are now available throughout summer. To get you there safely, we're cleaning our trains before, during and after your journey. Remember to book ahead via our app or on avantiwestcoast.co.uk. Avanti West Coast, wherever you're going, we're right there with you. Let's face it, after the year we've had, many of us are carrying a few extra lockdown pounds. All that comfort eating and little treating has made a mark. And those extra pounds can put strain on our bodies. Now's the time to turn things around. Let's shop smarter, eat better and move more. Getting started is easier than you think. For free tips and tools to lose weight, search Better Health. Let's do this. Swale Heating. We understand that older boilers and heating systems might need a bit more TLC. Our premium cover provides a thorough annual service. And if anything goes wrong with your boiler or heating system, our expert engineers are on hand 24-7 to get everything up and running really quickly to find out more visit swaleheating.com rely on us to keep you warm Eddie Mayer on LBC with Sage get back to bossing your business Looking through what the IPCC has been saying about the planet's future uh, it is not a fun read it's uh, gloomy, it's concerning. Uh, Tom Burke is with us till five o'clock. Let me just get through some of the texts and tweets that people have been sending. This is from Phoebe, 24 years old. I must admit, I've never really cared nor educated myself on climate change. As selfish as it sounds, sadly, it's the truth. However, my views these past few months have changed drastically. I'm worried. I fear for my future, the planet, and in years to come, I fear for my children and what their lives will be like. I hope the government can help make a change and promote green energy. We need more education available for the younger people so they can realise how serious it is. Use less plastic, etc. Without education, movement and solid actions, we are in serious trouble. On Twitter, with this, I'm building a house. It'll be thermal heat pump heated, aquaponic greenhouse. We'll grow our own protein and veg. It's my personal choice, but our choices have to go hand in hand with systemic industry changes. I make changes, industry must also drive change. Carl says, I just drove over the Avonmouth Bridge on the M5, jam-packed with commuter traffic. Why don't the government help reduce traffic by encouraging companies to support home or remote working? Well, Carl, uh, as if ripped from today's headlines, your comment. Uh, Janice says, I would go out tomorrow to buy an electric car, a new boiler, triple glazing and solar panels, but I don't have the money and I'm retired. Am I doomed? As usual, the people who didn't cause most of the mess will be forced to clean it up. Uh, here's Robbie in Reading. Hi, Robbie. What do you say? Hi, Eddie. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me on. Um, I'm Director of Plant-Based News, and uh, my question really is, considering animal agriculture is a leading driver for greenhouse gas emissions, we know that it's up to 18% of emissions in some figures, but it's much, much higher why isn't there more education uh, sort of globally, really, about the importance of removing or reducing animal products from our diet, considering these industries are so damaging and sort of contributing so heavily to the climate crisis? Thanks, Robbie. Tom? I agree with Robbie. I think we need to be doing a lot more to uh, encourage people to deal with agricultural emissions. There are amongst the emissions where you've got large numbers of decision makers so we need to do things for instance by putting a a marginal price on those emissions uh that's exactly where a carbon price or a carbon tax could help most so that you're encouraging people to move away either from uh diets that are intensively using dairy uh, uh products for instance or uh, uh, in what you, the way you use farm machinery, the way you use fertilizers. There's a, a big range of things that we could do to lower the emissions coming out of agriculture, not just pounding down on individuals and what they eat. We need to look across the whole of the industry and how it, it could uh, be arranged differently so that it actually reduced its burden. Thanks, Tom. And Robbie, Sam's in Enfield. Hello, Sam. 
Hi, Eddie. Hi, Tom. Um, my concern relates to the production of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. I think at the last estimate, the production of Bitcoin generates about 23 million cubic tons of carbon uh, waste per year. And that's only going to rise as the production of these coins becomes increasing, increasingly harder. We have uh, farms and farms of service just running, and all they're doing is churning away burning heat to produce these coins. Isn't it time we regulated them, green tax them, or came up with a like a green uh, like a green coin instead of a bitcoin? What do you think, Tom? Uh, Sam, I think you put your finger on a really important problem that worries me a lot. And it doesn't just worry me for the environment. It also worries me about the extent to which crypto coins can be used to, for instance, facilitate money laundering or organized crime. Frankly, I don't th I think they're exactly the kind of uh, being too clever by half invention that we'd be much better off without altogether. And the sooner governments ban them, the better, in my view. Uh, this is from John. Why do we have ministers championing a trade deal that would involve the transportation of beef from here to Australia and from Australia to here? Uh, Richard in Edinburgh says, what's to be done about Brazil? President Bolsonaro is determined to cut down as much of the rainforest as possible. Susie in Richmond, uh, young people are the biggest consumers and polluters on the planet. Perfectly good mobiles, clothes, shoes, laptops, TVs, constantly being replaced for newer versions. Yet they're the ones potentially most affected by climate change. Ironic, isn't it? Says Susie. Here's George in Crouch End. Hi, George. Hi there. Um, my question is, what's happening after we switched uh, to electric cars with all the battery being created, get deposed, and also when we're creating these batteries, the environmental impact for mining and uh, for the materials. Tom. Uh, absolutely right that there are issues to do with the mining of the materials. I think from my own experience, having worked with the mining industry for a long time, those are solvable problems and they're on a different scale from the problem of climate change. The most important piece as we go over to electric vehicles is to make sure that we are recycling those batteries properly all the time and that in the basic design we build in the recycling to the basic design of the batteries and of the infrastructure we build uh, to, to service electric vehicles. I think that I think there really is a good chance f to build the kind of uh, 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 circular economy, a circular economy uh, with batteries that we haven't had with other technologies. Thank you, George. Uh, this text from Tom. I'm 32. My partner and I have made the decision to not have any children due to the unsustainable number of people already here and the huge amount of resources children take. Why is there no support from the government to promote this? Secondly, we also follow a vegan lifestyle, which is an incredibly easy but efficient way of helping the planet. 0345 6060 973. Here's Ahmed in Dublin. Hi, Ahmed. Hi, Eddie. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm just phoning to say th the energy consumption we inc increase by using Google queries and putting in, in messages on Facebook and Twitter. Each, every time you make a query on Google, you spend as much energy as in a glass of orange juice. And see how many queries you have we made today, and how many other people make. So these are very important things to control. What do you say, Tom? Well, I, I say every time you can spot an opportunity like that to reduce your own pressure uh, on the climate, you should take it. And if that, I mean, it's very hard to specify. Everybody should should reduce their Google queries. You can't do that. You can't make people do that. But what you can do is get everybody into a state where wherever they see a little opportunity to do something, they do it because they understand there are lots of other people who are doing the same thing. Nobody is trying to do this on their own. And I know you can often feel as you as you do these little things yourself that somehow it's just you holding up the planet. I promise you it's not true. There are millions and millions and millions of people who share your concern who are trying to do the same things in their lives. Ahmed, thank you very much for the question. Tom, we can't thank you enough. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, and listeners love hearing from you. Um, we're always very busy when you're on. Uh, we'll probably see you again next week, the way things are going. But for now, thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank Take care you. of yourself. Bye -bye. That's Tom Burke, who chairs the E3G think tank. He was an advisor to the UK government on environmental policy.